Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Neese, Associate Commissioning Editor at Bristol University Press. We are here today with the series editors and book authors of the Sociology of Children and Families series. I'm of course very sorry that we're not doing this in person, but we are very excited to celebrate the books in the series and to announce the four new titles that published over this past year. So those books were Black Mothers and Attachment Parenting by Patricia Hamilton, Sharing Care by Rachel Brooks and Paul Hodkinson, A Child's Day by Killian Mullen, and Designing Parental Leave Policy by Barrett Branth and Ellen Caband. Joining us today is also series editor Esther Dermott, who is professor and head of school at the School for Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. Esther created the series alongside Janet Fink in 2016 and now co-edits the series with Debbie Watson, who is professor in child and family welfare, also at the University of Bristol. Unfortunately, Debbie can't be with us today, but Esther's going to say a couple of words and then we'll hand over the session to our authors who are going to give you an insight into their books. So Esther. So as you're going to hear in a few moments from a selection of our authors, the Sociology of Children and Families book series, we think, brings together you know, the very latest research on children and families. That's very broadly defined. And we're really proud of the quality and the range of content in the books that we've commissioned and published so far. And hopefully you'll also be impressed with uh, the content that we have. So the slide that you can see on the screen now at the moment um, gives you an overview of the books that we've published so far. So the first one that came out was Nanny Families. Um, it's up there and we've got Therese going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, we've published six books in the series so far. They all look beautiful with kind of very attractive covers, colours and photos. Um, what we're really interested in doing with the research monographs that we publish is to try and cover all aspects of family life. So it's not restricted just to parenting and children, but we can also, we're also interested and in, would be happy to explore proposals that we're looking at aging, care, wider personal relationships. And we're interested in having a book series that manages to go beyond what some of the journal articles manage to do. So that's because they either reflect the the findings of a more kind of extensive large scale research project or just offer a kind of more in depth analysis of contemporary families that is possible in the kind of the shorter journal length piece. We're interested in books um, that publishing work that offers up original empirical findings. And equally importantly, I think, and really important, it's writing that suggests new ways of thinking about social phenomenon, or perhaps introduces new sociological concepts for other people to work with and to take forward in their work in the future. So we're really looking at books, I don't think it's over, you know, exaggerating, to suggest that they're going to be a reference point in the field. We think that people coming, students, other academics, and also professionals and practitioners in fields are going to be going to these books to find out you know, the best way of understanding and thinking about work around children and families more broadly. The series is located in sociology as the book series title suggests, but as, a, as an exporter discipline, we also welcome submissions from those who are working in closely related areas as well. So social policy, social and cultural geography, demography, socio-legal studies, as well as, of course, childhood and youth studies. The book proposal forms in our, on our website, which we'll come back to at the slide at the end of this session, if you want to have a look at it and get formally in contact. If you'd like to get in touch informally, then please, about any research or writing plans that you have, then just contact me or Debbie the other editor or Shannon's very happy to field queries as well. And we're happy to have an informal chat about what your thinking is. So um, on that basis, I'm going to forward on to the first of our authors who's going to talk through um, a little bit about their book. And that's Paul Hodgkinson. We are just like to say really delighted to be part of such a, a fantastic series in, in so many respects. Um, Okay, so I guess starting point um, for our book is, is that uh, many contemporary fathers, as people will know, are, are more involved in childcare probably that, than their own fathers were for them. 
Um, but still most of them are, are very much the secondary carer, um, particularly when children are at their youngest. And that of course has huge implications for gender relations uh, across society and sort of across the, the life course really. Um, and against this context, uh, Sharing Care, co-authored uh, by Rachel Brooks and myself, explores the identities, journeys, and challenges of fathers who, unlike the majority, took on the role of either primary or equal carer for young children. Um, and the book sort of tries to place emphasis on, on really the range of, of different ways in which care can be shared and is being shared by, by such fathers. Uh, so some of the fathers in the study were on paternity leave, uh, others uh, were on a sort of long-term career break and referred to themselves as stay-at-home fathers. Um, but the majority actually were sort of juggling childcare on, on a sort of semi-permanent basis with um, working part-time or flexibly. And, and the majority also were kind of sharing more or less equally with their partners rather than, than, than one or, or the other being seen as the primary carer. Um, and so one of the, the things that we talk about in the book really is the need to sort of understand better and perhaps support this variety of different approaches um, uh, to, to, to being an involved father, if you like, and, and to the sharing of care. Um, and, and one example among many there might be um, the need to support flexible working arrangements and part-time working over time, as well as just focusing on sort of parental leave policies and so on, important though uh, those of course are too. So one of the first thing the book asks, I think is sort of what prompted fathers to take on these sort of unusual um, arrangements that, that, that they had become involved in. And we were particularly interested in whether those arrangements were, were kind of consistent with their existing intentions and identities, or whether they represented a, something of a sort of turning point for them um, in terms of their visions, their horizons, as we call it, uh, uh, of what was sort of feasible or possible for them uh, as a father. Um, and to cut a long story short there, I, I think we sort of place quite a lot of emphasis on the role that practical circumstances had, had, had played and sometimes changing practical circumstances in affecting a, a sort of change of direction um, for, for many of them in, in sort of enabling counter normative roles and, uh, and, um, and activities to be sort of countenanced and considered sort of seriously and, and then eventually sort of taken on. Um, and so that prompts us to sort of think and write a bit about how we can make sh care sharing more practically feasible for larger numbers of fathers, because after all, these the, the ones that we're speaking about in this, this um, uh, book are, are largely sort of outside the norm in, in their circumstances and the, their roles. The book also um, has a look at the kind of extent of the caregiving responsibilities and tasks that the fathers were taking on. Um, and how that sort of shifted and developed over time. And also in relation to that, and perhaps even more important, that their, how their caregiving identities, and, and again, their horizons, their visions were sort of shifting um, as they were sort of taking on these roles and, and, and becoming more competent gradually. And we found that many had embraced what they saw as kind of interchangeable parental identities where gender had reduced at least somewhat in importance and they felt that they were they were broadly the equivalent of their partners um, in terms of parenting. Although having said that there were some sort of limits to that, um, particularly relating to decision making and sort of ultimate responsibility which often still seemed to, to um, lie um, with the mother. Um, and also in relation to parent networks and fathers sort of difficulties and struggles sometimes um, uh, conversing and communicating with other parents, many of whom of course um, were mothers. And that sort of leads us on to a sort of further sort of fairly big point of the book, which is, is um, that it kind of contrasts fathers growing embrace of roles inside of their home and their increasing sort of competence and confidence um, inside the home with what they were doing with a tendency to feel out of place in um, daytime parenting spaces outside of the home. So many sort of um, told us about how they, they, they found themselves sort of starkly reminded of their gender really in some of their interactions with other parents, some of their interactions with passers-by and sometimes professionals as well who have a role in sort of early years care. 
Um, and so that prompts us to think about the, the need to make it easier for fathers to fully participate in care caregiving outside the home as well as inside it. Um, and then finally, in relation to father's vis visions of the future, um, many um, we were quite pleased to see um, and encouraged to see did envisage a very sort of extensive involvement for themselves in the future. But there were some inconsistencies and uncertainties about whether the extent of their current caregiving roles would, would continue. Um, and some still seem to sort of regard the mother possibly as the, the what we could, we sort of talk about sort of default maternal responsibility that even though actually some of the fathers were doing more than their partners currently or the same as their partners currently still ultimately there was this sense that you know maybe if circumstances were different perhaps she would still be the main carer which we thought was interesting and so that prompts some recommendations um, in the book centered upon making it easier for more fathers to take on um, that these kinds of um, more extensive roles, um, but also to enable them to sustain such roles and, and to take on all of such roles, if you like, rather, rather than feeling that certain aspects of the role were, were much more difficult for them. And I think hopefully that sort of is a very, very quick whistle stop summary of the book. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. That was fantastic. Um, for anyone watching who hasn't read it, just a reminder that you can ask your library for access to sharing care to read more. Um, and we'll now hand over to Therese to talk about Nanny Families, which was actually um, our first launch title in the series. And we're thrilled to announce that it's now available in paperback as well as available open access. Uh, so you can download the book in full from the Bristol University Press website. But over to Therese. Uh, I'm Therese Onving and I work at the Department of Gender Studies at Lund University in Sweden. And I have written this book, Nanny Families, together with uh, Sara Eldian, Associate Professor in Sociology at Lund University. And unfortunately, she could not be with us today, but she sends her very best to all of you. And I just want to say that we too are really happy to having been able to work with all of you at Bristol University Press and be part of this great series. And our book then is a result of an extensive qualitative study of family practices in families that hire nannies and a pairs to care for their children which is a growing phenomena internationally, but now also in Sweden. So we argue that studying Sweden is a particularly interesting because of recent changes in the Swedish welfare state. The extensive publicly funded daycare system has been complemented by a growing private market of nannies and au pairs, a category of care workers that hardly existed before. And this market in Sweden is state supported. And this is done through a tax deduction, which makes the services, for example, then of nannies then cheaper for the employing families. And this is not only a service then that, but despite this, this is mainly a service that can be afforded by middle, upper middle class families. And this then we argue creates new inequalities in and between families in the midst of everyday life. And our aim in this book has been to show that paid domestic care workers are important actors in the doing of family. While their position has been studied in global care chain research, they have largely been neglected in family studies. Another aim with our book has also been to listen to the narratives of children taken care of by nannies and au pairs. And with a few exceptions, this perspective has been missing within the field. So in the book, Nanny Families, all three categories of actors involved in the practice of doing nanny or pair care are included. The parents hiring the nannies and au pairs, the nannies and au pairs themselves and the children. Um, and in the book, we argue that when welfare states such as Sweden decide to promote and encourage private markets for domestic care services, they also create new inequalities between families. Those who can afford these services 
and thereby realize ideals of gender equality and good parenting and those who cannot. And they also reproduce inequalities in families through building on the idea that care is simple, an activity that can easily be divided up and delegated, preferably to young girls and especially those with few other options. And this then increases the invisibility, we argue, of the actual complex and emotionally demanding activity that these girls are engaged in. So the nanny or the au pair becomes, we argue in the book, the invisible glue that keeps the jigsaw puzzle of family life from falling apart. And if the nanny and au pair markets continue to grow, it is thus likely uh, that inequalities will increase, increase in and between families in the midst of everyday family practices in welfare states as Sweden. So that was a short summary of the book. Thank you. Fantastic. That was great. Thank you so much, Therese. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Killian to talk about his book, A Child's Day. Thanks very much. Uh, it's really nice to be able to join you all, uh, to join my fellow authors and editors and publishers. Um, I have my book here, which I'm very happy about. Um, so my book was uh, A Child's Day. Uh, it's a study of change in how children spend time. Uh, and I drew on three um, national time use surveys uh, uh, covering a period from 1975 to 2015. So uh, over a period of 40 years. Um, and in approaching the book, um, I'm sort of interested in time use um, uh, with respect to what it tells us about child well-being. Um, uh, and so very often we talk about child well-being um, with reference to how they spend their time. Um, and of course, there are many debates and, and, and stories in the media about children spending too much time doing this, not enough time doing that. And of course, all of these debates were blown out of the water with lockdown, right? So when I was writing this book, we were talking about, you know, with concerns around children spending too much time online, too much time indoors, and then suddenly lockdown happened. And in a way, all of that just went out the window, right? But we, we shall see how, how much we return to normal. But so, but if you can cast your mind before lockdown, when we were, you know, when we were having these debates, um, I was very much interested in, in, I guess, the quality of the information and the data that we had, right? And that these debates were drawing on. And so what I was interested to do, to do in the book is to really conduct a very kind of thorough uh, quantitative analysis of change in how children spend time using the best available data and really trying to puncture through um, uh, some of the sort of crude, I would say, simplistic narratives around, around how children's time has changed. Now, as I say in the book, in the broad sort of outline, uh, the book doesn't tell us anything particularly new, um, uh, but uh, what it tries to do is really kind of show uh, some of the, the sort of complex contingencies around those changes. Um, so, for example, it's not you won't be particularly surprised to, to know that children are spending more time in front of screens, but it was kind of interesting to show how that varied across gender, uh, age, uh, and type of day. So there's a lot of sort of detail um, uh, underneath those kind of headline trends uh, that the book really unpacks. Um, the, the, the second thing, in addition to sort of interested in, in sort of child well-being, and this is what drew me to this series is, is the way in which time use and understanding time use can tell us something about everyday lives, the everyday lives of children. Um, and in, in the sort of space in the field, uh, a lot of that research tends to be qualitative, which is uh, um, uh, really gets into the experience of that time. But I wanted to add to that in sort of highlighting the fact that there's a quantitative element to this as well. Um, and I think with time use, you're able to bring together that, that sort of story about child well-being, but also uh, an understanding of the everyday lives of children in terms of how they spend time. Um, and so, yeah, so the, uh, and, and can I just say, I'll just uh, go back to Esther's point. It was just absolutely brilliant to have that, that space that a book gives you. 
Um, uh, and um, yeah, so so that's all really. Fantastic, thanks Killian. that was really interesting. Um, a Child's Day is available on our website and again, you can ask uh, your library for access to the book if you haven't read that in full yet. So we're gonna to turn to Esther again, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit about what we're looking for in future contributions to the series. I mean, I think that the, the, the three books that you've heard a little bit more in more detail about now do give kind of, um, given a bit more detail, evidence about what we're looking for. So there's not one particular method that we're prioritizing as yeah, Killian's really detailed quantitative work over a really long period of time also studies that are about in-depth qualitative um you know kind of ethnographic inspired work you know so the book series doesn't have a method or one kind of approach that it wants to prioritize it's really about prioritizing what are the interesting insights and what are the big kind of questions that we want to address and as a someone who's a kind of a multi-methodist myself um i guess you know th those will reflect either they may be policy reflections as the designing parental leave book talked about they may be have quantitative or qualitative kind of uh, approaches and i think that we actually kind of in a way you want to read all of these books together not just one of them on their own because they sit so nicely together um I, yeah so i think i've suggested what um we're interested in just anything that's innovative and new and exciting and seems like something that anyone working in this area should know about and would also be excited by um yeah and um and as Killian again said you know just something where if we're looking at you know 80,000 words ish you've got a chance to explore some of your ideas in more depth to really you know ex explore the kind of the detail of the qualitative work or kind of just dig down into some of the different kinds of analysis and explore that i think that's perfect i think that summarized exactly what we're looking for um yeah so i think just to close the session uh, just a massive thank you to our wonderful authors and series editor for making this happen as esther said we'd love to hear from you about your next publishing project if you think the series might make a good home for your work feel free to email me or esther or debbie uh, we can either carry on conversations over email or arrange a meeting um, just a quick note for those that aren't familiar with us, Bristol is a not-for-profit university press. We're extremely proud of the scholarship we publish. Uh, as you've heard from our authors, we have an ambitious publishing programme and we hope that you'll follow us and look out for all of our exciting, exciting new titles that are coming out. Um, you can visit our website, follow us on Twitter or sign up to our newsletter, which is where you get 35% off of our books. So thank you very much again and uh, look forward to hopefully meeting some of you in person soon.